Dear colleagues and friends, welcome to today's broadcast, Tips and Tricks in Imaging Your Patients with Valvular Heart Disease, Aortic Stenosis, Mitral Regurgitation, and Tricuspid Regurgitation. I'm Pepe Zamorano, Head of Cardiology at the University Hospital Ramón y Cajal in Madrid, and your chair for today, and it gives him pleasure to be joined by a world-class faculty, Monsters of Valve Disease, excellent teachers and top speakers, With us, we have today Dr. Becky Han. She is the scientific, the program scientific director. She is director of the interventional echocardiography at New York Presbyterian at Columbia University Medical Center. Also, Philippe Pivaro, professor at the Department of Medicine of Laval University in Canada. Martin Swans, cardiologist at San Antonio Hospital in the Netherlands. And finally, Patricio Lancelotti, who is head of cardiology at the department uh, in the Liege University Hospital in Belgium. Today's broadcast is brought to you by Radcliffe Cardiology and is supported by Edwards Life Science. It is really an interactive session. You are the important ones. Don't be shy. We have polls, live audience Q&A, so get involved. We are waiting for your questions. Please submit all your questions or doubts to our faculty in the web form below the stream, and we will address as many as possible as we progress. But first, I would like to take a moment to look to the agenda today. I think that uh, after this uh, short introduction, we will start with the tips and tricks in imaging your patients with tricuspid regurgitation, and this will be addressed by Patricio Lancelotti, Then we have the tips and tricks in imaging your patients with mitral regurgitation, and this will be addressed by Martin Swan, and the tips and tricks for imaging your patients with aortic stenosis that will be brilliantly addressed by uh, Philippe Pivaro. So, in fact, before we start, I'd like to hand over to our program director, Dr. Becky Han, who was really instrumental in the formulation of today's program. So, Becky take us through the learning objectives of the day. Thank you so much, Pepe, and thank you for moderating this, this wonderful session, this webinar. Uh, the learning objectives today will be to learn the essential echocardiographic views to assess tricuspid regurgitation severity with the five-grade scheme, to learn the essential echo views to assess mitral regurgitation etiologies and severity, to learn how to interpret TR and MR results and appropriately uh, refer those patients to further management, to learn about the best practices to correctly diagnose aortic stenosis using echocardiography, and then finally to learn how to avoid the most common pitfalls in correctly grading aortic stenosis severity. So uh, very lofty goals today, but I'm sure that our speakers will be able to accomplish these learning objectives. Pepe? <laughs> Thank you, Becky. I think that there is no doubt that valvular heart disease in the 21st century is a re-emerging public health problem. In fact, it's no doubt an increased prevalence. And why is this? Because it's affecting the elderly, it's mostly degenerative, and no doubt also that require new approaches. Well, if we look back to the 1970s, the baby boom was there. And what happened today, 20, 30, 40 years later, As you can see here in this graph, you can clearly see that we will have in 230, we will have many patients that will be retired, many patients that will be over 80 year old. And in fact, if we analyze and we do see what are the percentage of persons age 65 expected to survive to age 90, we can see that by 250, more or less, more than 40% of our patients will be in that range. I think that the valve heart disease in the 21st century, in our days, and what is coming, is a new epidemic of the degenerative valve diseases, 
no doubt that we have a lot of unmet needs and new hopes for us and for patients of improved surgical results and new medical and interventional therapies. But to me, also never forget that BHC management implies comprehensive quantitative echocardiography. And this is what we are going to learn today. And with this in mind, I turn back to you, Becky. Thank you so much. That was, that was really a wonderful uh, presentation to set the scene uh, for our current webinar. So without any further delay, I'd like to hand it over to Patrizio Lancelotti, who will steer us through the tips and tricks in imaging your patient with tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to speak today about uh, the tricuspid valve, often called the forgotten valve. So uh, maybe uh, let me uh, start with uh, questions for you all the audience about tricuspid regurgitation. So the question, uh, is it mainly related to atriogenic etiology? Is this rare entity for which the outcome does not depend on the gravity severity? Is it associated with a worse outcome only if there is pulmonary hypertension? And does quantifications require the use of multiparametric approach? And uh, we will see exactly the answer at the end of this presentation. So uh, importantly to know is uh, about the etiology. Uh, the tricky speed regurgitation has many causes, and the most common cause is related to secondary uh, tricky speed valve disease, this means not related to an intrinsic disease of the valve or the leaflet itself. It is mainly related to uh, the presence of left valve disease. And you can see that in only 8-10% of the patients, uh, it is related to what it is called atriogenic etiology uh, and mainly associated with atrial fibrillation, where the modification in terms of the morphology is mainly observed at the level of the mind of the tricuspid annulus that is more dilated with a, a, a small tethering is in comparison with uh, uh, the patients with uh, uh, what is called the right ventricular depending or related tricuspid regurgitation where there is a, a huge stenting. And you can also see here in the slides uh, the primary etiology with all this uh, called also organic tricuspid regurg. Regarding the uh, outcome, the presence of tricuspid regurgitation is also associated with an impaired outcome. And moderate severe tricuspid regurg was associated in this uh, large uh, study uh, with uh, a systematic review or meta-analysis uh, with a twofold increase mortality risk compared to a uh, no or mild tricuspid regurg, but it was also associated with increased cardiac mortality and heart failure hospitalization. And even this after adjustment for the presence of pulmonary hypertension and over of uh, over right heart failure, right ventricular dysfunctions, and also the presence of uh, atrial fibrillation. Regarding the tricuspid annulus, the tricuspid annulus dilates along the free wall of the right ventricle, and uh, it is important to know that the tricuspid annulus is now planar is uh, elliptical in terms of shape. There are two high points and two low points, and that's important to know, at least for regarding the dilatations that occurs the, along the free wall of the right ventricle. And uh, in this uh, study, they used the 2D and 3D echo to really understand the impact of the size, shape, and orientation of the dilatation of the tricuspid animals. And they show that the morphology of the annular dilatations is totally related to the etiology of uh, the tricuspid regurgitations. And the more posteriorly displayed tricuspid annulus was most frequently observed or noted in patients with atrial fibrillations 
But more importantly was the fact that a larger 3D uh, transesophageal echo trichospedandal diameter was observed as compared to the 2D uh, echocardiography, which is of importance when we try to analyze the diameter. Uh, when uh, we try to understand how to measure the trichospedandalus, of course, the measurements is uh, uh, mainly performed in uh, using the uh, apical views. And normally you should uh, use the focus view of the right ventricle, really uh, focusing on the right ventricle. You can also use the right ventricular inflow. But if you take into account the fact that with this uh, Apical, but this is the same with uh, the short axis using the personal view. You do not pass through the annulus in its larger uh, diameter. So this means when we compare to some surgical studies, and this is the study from Dreyfus showing that if you put an annuloplasty in patients with dilated trichospid annulus over 70 millimeter in a arrested art, uh, you improve the outcome, at least the operative mortality and maybe the heart failure symptoms over the time. But importantly, what they said is that if you use this diameter, probably if you correct this for uh, the circumferentials, you can see that normally for 70 millimeter, it is 45 millimeter, which means five millimeter more that what normally it is mentioned in our guidelines that the cutoff is 40 millimeter. So this means that if you want to have the longest diameter, you need to measure this distance using the subcostal view because there it's the anterior septal and anterior posterior commissure. So this distance is the largest that is observed in patient. Uh, when we look at the physiopathology, clearly you need to measure the trichospedandular diameter uh, during a quiet respirations or, or at the end of expirations, mainly related to the fact that with inspirations, you have an increase in all diameter and even in the trichospid regurg severity. Regarding the grading of trichospid regurg, you need to use a multi-parametric approach. The first relates to a qualitative assessment of the valve to some measurements that are called semi-quantitative. And after that, you have to provide some numbers and these are the quantitative measurements. For that, what we use, we use the first approach that is to uh, clearly have an ID of the morphology of the tricky speed valve. And uh, this morphology can be and should be assessed using multiple views. But first, regarding the anatomy, what you should know is that you have the valve and you have all the neighboring structure where depending on the treatment that you can provide, you can have some injuries. The most typical example is the right coronary arteries in case of using an amyloplasty device. But also you need to know exactly the leaflet morphology the largest is the anterior, but the one that you always use, or at least in most of the case, is the septal one for anchoring the leaflets for grasping when you use transcatheter approach. So don't forget the coronary sinus and the AV node for any kind of complication. Now, regarding the morphology, it is important to understand that we can have access to new nomenclature systems in order to have a common language, even with uh, the person doing the transcatheter therapies. And this is a wonderful study performed by uh, Rebecca, by Becky, uh, in four centers to Europe, to uh, uh, US, 579 patients, and they're trying to understand the morphology of the tricky Swiss valve. And they divide this morphology according to different uh, characteristics. So type one, three leaflets, type two, uh, two leaflets, type 3, 8, 4 leaflets, type 3, B, 4 uh, leaflets, and then after that, you can see type 3, C, and type 4 with more than four leaflets. But what is important to mention is that the tricky speed valve has three well-defined leaflets in only 54% of patients and four functional leaflets in 39% of the patients, with the type 3, B being the most common 
Uh, and that's of importance regarding the concept of the thoracic speed uh, uh, therapy is using trans catheter. Now, of course, you have to describe the anatomy and the morphology of the two speed valve. You can use the flow chamber view. Of course, you can use the different cutting plane and you have the septal in yellow and the, you can have the anterior and the posterior. Of course, if you angle a bit uh, the, the probe, you can have the anterior leaflet if you angle a bit less, but uh, depending if you are close to the coronary sinus, uh, you can get also uh, the septal, but also the posterior leaflet. So use multiple views to clearly assess uh, the tricky speed valve because it is a three leaflet valve and you need to understand the, the variability into the morphology. Now, regarding the valve morphology, uh, these are two examples. On the right, you, you can have a, a typical tricky speed regurg related to a secondary uh, tricky speed regurgitation. And on the left, you can see something that is totally different because we have a mixed disease with some degree of uh, modification of the tricky speed valve, but also some degree of tethering. This is mixed tricky speed valve disease. So secondary and probably primary as well. So when we look at the tricky speed valve deformations in uh, patients with secondary tricky speed regurg, and you uh, evaluate the tethering area or the tethering distance, here you have, you have some cutoffs, but these cutoffs are associated with residual tricky speed regurgitation with tricky speed annuloplasty. This means that you need to perfectly examine the tricky speed valve morphology. Now, regarding uh, the quantitative assessment, the first step to do after the morphological assessment is to use the color Doppler. And you need to perfectly align the uh, different views uh, to examine where is the flow, but also the different component of the flow using the four chamber view, but also the writing flow and every kind of uh, views that will allow you to better examine uh, the tricky speed valve and the tricky speed regurgitation. Don't forget with the color flow, you have a lot, a lot of uh, uh, limitations related to uh, important, according to uh, the orientation of the jet, to the technical consideration, etc. So now regarding the quantitative assessment, often we can say that we use the Vena contractor and we use the PISA method. For the Vena contractor, uh, it is important to be perfectly aligned and to delineate the three components of the regurgitant jet. So the flow convergence zone, the Vena contractor, the narrowest part of the regurgitant jet, and the expansion of the jet into the right atrium. The Vena contractor is finally a surrogate for the regurgitant orifice uh, size. It's independent of the flow rate and the driving pressure for a fixed orifice, is less dependent than the color flow doper of, on technical factors. And it is good to identify severe tricky speed regurg when it is over seven millimeter. Now regarding the PISA method, okay, the PISA, we need to use a zoom uh, with the color flow. We need to decrease the uh, color scale, so the Nyquist limit. And here you can observe the PISA radius and you just need to measure the radius from the point of the color uh, uh, aliasing uh, to the vena contractor uh, itself. So this means that you have this measurement, you have the PISA radius, the Nyquist limit is often 28, 32 uh, med, um, centimeter per second, and you can derive using the tricky speed regurgitation velocity, uh, and the time velocity integral, you can derive the effective regurgitant orifice area, but also the regurgitant volume. Of course, in any kind of these measurements, keep in mind that for the PISA method, there are some advantages, but also some disadvantages. The advantages is that this is not affected by any other valve lead. The disadvantages relate to the fact that we need an hemispheric uh, conversion zone. So this means in most of the case, especially in secondary tricky speed regards, this is not the case. 
Of course, you need to measure the right atrial size, the right ventricular size. Uh, all these measurements are load dependent and also the orientations of the plane is sometimes difficult to be sure that we measure the largest diameter of the right ventricle. Don't forget to assess the vena cava and the respiratory changes, at least to assess the pulmonary pressure. Don't forget to assess the continuous wave Doppler, especially because the continuous wave Doppler will give you an indication about the severity of the tricky speed regurge. When the uh, a full envelope is present, is more in a relation with a severe tricky speed regurge, and especially when there is this kind of triangular contour. Regarding the systolic reversal flow into the hepatic vein, this is a specific sign for severe turkey speed regurgitation. So nowadays, we can use this scheme to uh, at least try to uh, grade the severity of turkey speed regurgitation. And we can go through. We have some specific signs of severe turkey speed regurgitation, but at the end of the day, the idea would be an uh, effort to be made to clearly quantitate the severity of the tricky speed regurg using the venar contractor, the effective regurgitant orifice, and the regurgitant volume. Why this is important? Because the severity of tricky speed regurg is associated with the outcome, and the parameter that is important is 40 millimeter square. Clearly, this is a cutoff that you should keep in mind. But is it enough to say that we need just to say that it is severe? When we look at the literature, we can say now, and this is a scheme proposed by Becky and Pepe Zamorano, that when we go through the severity, we should be maybe more granular, and we should classify this maybe in severe, massive, and torrential tricuspid regurgitation, because this is clearly associated with the outcome. This is, was the first study showing an impact on survival and the overall uh, combined income, mortality, and rehospitalizations. And in this study, using two different cohorts with a validation cohort, a vena contractor more than 0.92 was associated with a worse outcome. And this was confirmed in the validated cohort regarding the distinction between the severity severe and massive or torrential tricky speed regurg, and this was the same in this uh, study. Now, what are the limitations of uh, uh, the PISA method and also the measurements of the vena contractor? These limitations are mainly related to the morphology of uh, the tricky speed regurgitation and orifice, because is uh, almost as you can see here, irregular, is not circular, is more elliptical. And if we use just one measurement using the full chamber view, we will clearly underestimate the severity of the tricky speed regurg. And that is the reason why we could, in some cases, measure or evaluate using 3D echo, the 3D vena contractor, that is a more associated or related to the PISA, uh, to the uh, regurgitant volume or effective regurgitant orifice area obtained by the Doppler method than, than by uh, the PISA method itself. And that's something very important uh, to mention. So if we want to summarize uh, this study, we can say that the Doppler effective regurgitant orifice area and the vena contractor the average had a high correlation with the 3D vena contractor. And the PISA effective regurgitant orifice correlate with the 3D vena contractor, but underestimate the severity of tricky speed regurg in nearly one third of the patient. And that's important, especially in patients with uh, elliptic uh, aspect of the regurgitant orifice. Uh, are there any pitfalls? Regarding the 3D vena contractor, of course, if you have multiple jet, and this could be also challenging and uh, uh, time consuming. Uh, to finish off my presentation, I would like to say that uh, we need to assess the right ventricular function using different parameters, 
But let me tell you that all these parameters are clearly load dependent. So today it is very difficult to really ascertain about the right ventricular function or the presence of right ventricular dysfunction. So the size, the volume, and also we can use the right ventricular strain that provides you probably more ID about the intrinsic contractility as for the right ventricle. So here are some cutoff values that you can find to define anomalies. And also importantly in guidelines, it is said that you need to assess the pulmonary pressure. And that's true. We need to assess the pulmonary pressure, but there is a discordant values between the invasive and the echo measurements. And you can see that this is observed in 20% of the patients and those with a discordance between invasive and echo have the worst outcome. This means that in some cases, when you want to refer these patients for intervention, please do a right cat to be sure about the presence or not of pulmonary hypertension. So again, I would like to insist on the fact that you need to use multi-parametric approach and multimodality imaging with echo mainly for quantifications and probably the other imaging modality more for the assessment of right ventricular function volume and structure. So I would like to conclude that the tricuspid valve has a complex anatomy that is highly variable. The secondary tricuspid regurg is the most frequent. The tricuspid regurg is highly prevalent conditions with poor prognosis, and we need to use multi-parametric and multi-modality approach to assess the severity. Of course, regarding the treatment, maybe this could be discussed, but whenever we suspect that we have more than moderate tricky speed regurg. We need to refer the patients to a comprehensive valve centers for further assessment and management. So let me finish by the results of the poll. Uh, may I have the results? Okay. Uh, yeah, a bit more. Uh, Okay, uh, that, that's very interesting because I would say that finally I was very clear. The majority said uh, you need to use a multi-parametric approach to quantitate the severity of the tricky speed recurrence. So I think I was a good teacher. Thank you so much. Indeed, Patricia, you are a great teacher, and I think it's clear. But we are having some questions here in the in the web page, and uh, let me start with a quick one. Patricia, TR is mainly a volume load dependent, while mitral regurgitation is load and pressure. So why we should use the same regurgitant volumes to establish the severity of the disease? Should we change this approach? Yeah, regarding the regurgitant volume, you know that we have not the same cutoff values for the tricky speed regurg and for the mitral regurg. And that's mainly related to the fact that when we want to measure the volume with uh, the tricky speed valve, uh, due to the fact that it's totally load dependent, uh, and also due to the fact that if we have a significant tricky speed regurgitation, there is a clear near equalization of the pressure between the right atrium and the right ventricle. So the velocity of the tricky speed jet will be decreased and the regurgitant volume will be artificially decreased using the conventional method. So this means that the cutoff from the left and the right valve disease in terms of mitral and tricky speed are totally different. Lower for tricky speed, 45 millimeter, and the higher for the mitral, uh, around 60. Uh, and that's very important. That's a good question, Pepe. It's important for the audience to understand why there is this difference in terms of cut of values for defining severe tricky speed regurgitation. Becky, do you have a question here? 
Yeah, uh, that, that was just a beautiful presentation, uh, Patricio. I really, I think you made it really clear, as, as the audience thought so as well, um, that you need to use these multi-parametric methods. But for the clinical cardiologists who's, who's out there uh, looking at these echoes, are there one or two parameters that you like to use um, that can help them really distinguish between moderate and therefore patients who should be sent to the comprehensive valve center? or suggest that, look, it's mild, and you can just continue to follow those patients, or you have to look for other reasons for their symptoms. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, the importance first is to mention that when we want to assess or quantitate the severity of turkey speed regurg, please use the same condition. Uh, at least you need to assess the patients in the morning or in the afternoon, but you need to know that if the patients take diuretics or not, because this will change the severity of the tricuspid regurg over the day, depending on the volume load that the patients present. So that's important. Always, you need to assess the tricuspid regurg in quiet respirations or at the end of the expirations and not in full inspirations, because of course you will increase artificially the severity of the tricuspid regurg and any kind of measurements. Now, what kind of parameters? Uh, what is important to say? If you have really trivial or really mild with this regurg, you need to just follow the patients and uh, you need to keep on like this. But if you have some parameters, like a vena contractor, that is the limit of the severity of severe to speed regurg, about five, six millimeter. If you have uh, a systolic blending of uh, you know, the uh, uh, hepatic vein flow. If you have a, 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 a small velocity uh, using your tricky speed regurg and you don't see exactly the vena contracta well, you don't see very well the PISA, you need to really dare think about even other methodology like 3D vena contracta because if you have a secondary tricky speed regurg, you will always end up having an underestimation of the severity. So when you consider that at least it is moderate, you need to use all the quantitative parameters and you need to try to get even maybe complementary imaging assessment. Yeah. Okay, Patricio, I think that uh, this is all the time that we have for this motivating discussion. Now it's time to move to our second presentation, but before we do so, I would like to remind you to keep submitting your questions for our panel on the web page, and our panel will address as many as possible. Now I'm going to hand over to Martin Swans to take us through the tips and tricks in imaging your patients with mitral rotation. Martin. Thank you very much, Peppa, for the uh, for the introduction, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here in this uh, excellent webinar. And uh, I have the honor to discuss with you some tips and tricks in imaging the the, the mitral valve regurgitation. So let's see if he moves. These are my disclosures. Let's see if he moves on. Yeah. So MR is the most common type of moderate or severe heart valve disease among adults in the Western countries older than 55 years, and its presence increases further as a function of age. And the presence of, of, uh, of the prevalence of the three valves we're discussing here today are shown in this graph, in which you can clearly see a steep increase of valve disease with age and especially for patients with mitral valve regurgitation as shown here in red line. Uh, 
And the evaluation and management of patients with an MR can be very challenging for clinicians, and in part because of its various causes, dynamic nature, and insidious progression. And therefore, I think in all the recent publications and, and consensus statements, emphasis has been placed on the multidisciplinary team decision, making this to optimize outcomes for patients with valvular heart disease, including those with aortic stenosis, but also mitral valve regurgitation. Let's see. There's some delay. Yeah. So MR derives from functional impairment or anatomical derangement from one or more of the components of the mitral valve apparatus net necessary for a normal function of the mitral valve. And this includes the left ventricle, papillary muscles, cornea, uh, the leaflets, of course, and the annulus, as shown here on the left by a very well-known figure, I think, from Catherine Otto publication. And on the right, we can see an anatomical specimen showing the mitral valve apparatus. So it's much more than only the leaflets. And before jumping into quantification of the MR, and when you look at an echo image, I think it's important to wait a second, because first it's important to question yourself, why is there regurgitation? So to look at the etiolo etiology or mechanism before the quantification. So MR is considered to be primary when the mechanism of regurgitation are related to the disease of the mitral valve leaflets or the cordae. So for example, it's myxomatosis disease of endocarditis. And in these patients, the dilated left atrium and the left ventricle are frequently strong, is a strong clue of a severe chronic MR and finding a pulmonary flow reversal in the pulmonary vein is specific for a severe MR. And assessing the MR in these patients is also frequently easier than patients with a secondary MR. So a secondary MR is characterized by incompetence due to adverse changes of the left ventricle, shape or function with or without annular dilatation, for example, an ischemic cardiomyopathy. And in these patients, dilated left ventricle and left atrium may be due to the underlying cardiomyopathy, and the flow in the pulmonary veins is usually blunted due to the cardiomyopathy itself and not due to the EMR. And frequently in these patients, it's much more difficult to quantify the EMR. Let's see. And furthermore, there's also mixed mitral valve regurgitation. So we have both mitral, uh, primary and secondary MR, like a prolapse or a flail in a patient with an ischemic cardiomyopathy. So it's important to know that primary and secondary MR are really different diseases with different outcomes and indications for treatments. And as shown here on this, this slide, we can see two examples for Becky very nicely. And on the left, we can see a patient with a primary MR with abnormal valve disease with excessive motion of the leaflets. And on the right, I think my slides are going a little bit faster than I want. And on the right, we can see example of a secondary MR due to a restrictive posterior leaflage, which causes a pseudo prolapse of the AMVL, AMVL or an overriding AMVL. And to help physicians with to distinct primary and secondary MR, I think this table or figure can be used looking at the two main features of the mitral valve. So first, using, I think, the well-known classification of Carpe J to look at the leaflet motion, which type 1 has a normal leaflet motion, type 2, we have the excessive motion, and the type 3, the restricted motion. And as a second step, we will be looking at the leaflet morphology. So putting our previous patients in the table here, they are well classified. So the first patient goes to the primary MR and the second patients go to a secondary MR. And also we can see in this table the atrial MR, and this is a different category. So I will explain this a little bit further. So classically, secondary MR occurs as a consequence of adverse re healthy remodeling, papillary muscle displacement, leaflet tethering and annular dilatation, and also the mitral valve closing forces may be reduced. And this, uh, for example, can be caused by an ischemic cardiomyopathy with an infarction in the infrabasal region, or at the other spectrum, or the end of the spectrum, we have, can have a severely dilated spherical left ventricle with markedly depressed LV systolic function and secondary MR along the co-optation line. 
But on the left, and, and, and we have this, the, the secondary amount caused by endolent dietation. So this is in context of patients who are having a long persistent AF, which gives LA stretch and mainly endolent dilatation with it despite the preserved uh, left ventricular systolic function. So the frequently the leaflets are less tethered, but there's mainly endolent dilatation. And here we can see all sorts of causes of primary and secondary MR are, are, are categorized according to the leaflet motion. I think a very well and nice table for this. So before we go to the next step uh, uh, and looking for the etiology and the mechanism, it's the quantification of MR. And why is this so important? Simply because the severity of MR, like with TR, is related to the outcomes of these patients. With patients having a more severe MR, having a worse prognosis. And this accounts for patients with a primary MR, even if they are asymptomatic, as nicely shown here in the, the uh, important publication by Marisa Rana from the Mayo Clinics. But it also accounts for patients with a secondary MR, where the event-free survival decreases with increasing MR severity and the risk of mortality increases with functional class of these patients, showing significant mortality in patients in neoclass 3 and 4, but also these patients have a quality of life which is poor because they are also re frequently repeatedly hospitalized. Let's see. So the next step is, is uh, 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 going for the quantification of the uh, MR. And I think it's especially important for the in-between range. So if you have a clear trace or you have a clear massive uh, mitral valve regurgitation, it's not that important, but especially in the in-between range, this is, we need to be more accurate. And as already said, it, it, the timing of intervention is also defined by the severity. And underestimation of the severity will lead to increased mor morbidity and mortality of our patient, but overestimation will lead to unnecessary procedures. And of course, we owe this actually to our patient to be more accurate and not just guessing. So now, how are we going to quantify the MR? We can use different methods. So we can quantify how much blood is going into the, uh, 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 going back towards the left atrium. So we, by calculating the regurgitated form of regurgitated fraction, we can measure how big the hole is. So the effective regurgitated orifice area, this is not the anatomical orifice area. We can see what the effects are on the chambers. So we're going to measure the left ventricle and the left atrial volumes. And we're going to uh, uh, see what the effects are on the hemodynamics by measuring the left atrial pressure and the pulmonary systolic pressure. Let's see if he moves. Doesn't want to move. Okay. And for the assess assessment of, of severity, a compre comprehensive approach is recommended where multiple parameters are evaluated and integrated to find the determination of the severity of the MR. And it's important to emphasize that there is no single echocardiographic parameter that has the measurement precision and reproducibility to serve as a sole arbiter of the MR severity. But before we go to the different quantification methods, I think it's important to keep in mind that the severity of MR is greatly influenced by the hemodynamic state of the patient. So particularly in secondary MR, hypovolemia, hypotension, and low cardiac output can be reduced the severity of the MR. But also changes in the uh, hemodynamic due to general anesthesia can lead to a significant MR uh, reduction. Let's see, it seems not to move. Here we go. So if we are on the table doing an intervention, it's important to uh, mimic awake state, so giving inotropics, vasopressors, or fluid therapy before you do the assessment of the MR. And this, this is just an example to show you what general anesthesia can do for the severity of the MR. And there's a small study showing that approximately 50% of the patients improved at least one grade of MR severity when assessed under general anesthesia. So why all these efforts were for quantification and not just simply looking at the color Doppler images as most of us do, although they still say they don't? 
And I think it's nicely shown in this publication from our British colleagues where they show, uh, looked at the inter, uh, intra-observer viability and also looking for evidence that the observer grading is influenced by the severity of the immediate preceding cases. So what they basically did is that they showed this image now, hopefully three times to an observer among a selection of unselected MR clips. And once, proceed, and, and once it was proceeded without the designated order, and once it was proceeded by clips with less severe MR, and once proceeded with clips with more severe MR, and what they found, that this has a great in influence on the, infl uh, the observer because there was only one observer that had a consistent grading. So I think we have to do more than just looking at the images because it doesn't need to be influenced on the mood of the, uh, of the echocardiographer. So let's look at different measurements we can do. Like with the tricuspid, we have qualitative and semi-quantitative measurements we can do. So the first method is, is again going back to the color Doppler me method, if it wants to move on. And the assumption is that the, the color Doppler uh, uh, severity increases with severity of the MR that increases in size and extent of the jet in the left atrial appendage. But unfortunately, as shown before, this is le less accurate because it mainly depends on many technical and hemodynamic factors. And that's why it's not recommended by the guidelines. And maybe it's good to mention that the color you're seeing are not uh, are velocities and not the flow itself. And the figure on the left, left on this slide, and hopefully it advances again, shows you how the color jet is influenced by the machine settings like Nyquist level, gain settings, and transducer frequency. So you will see more uh, uh, MR with, with a, a TEE probe. And on the right, you can see it's also influenced by the jet direction on the color Doppler area. So on the one hand, we can have a color Doppler which you will frequently overestimate if it's a central jet because of entrainment of the red blood cells into the regurgitated jet. But on the other hand, you might underestimate the severity for severe eccentric jets due to the Coanda effects, which is the tendency of the fluid jet to be attached to the convex surface. Pulse Doppler evaluation by pulmonary foam, it can be used, of course, it's a, and normally we have an S wave, which is larger than the D wave, and the more severe the MR becomes, the S wave decreases, and then we can have, in, at the end, have, uh, with severe MR, we can have flow reversal. But if we have a cardiomyopathy or we have uh, atrial fibrillation or elevated LA pressures, this can be already blunted by the cardiomyopathy or atrial fibrillation itself. So it lacks specificity, specificity for the diagnosis of MR. So, it's, look, and the next measurement is the Covena contractor. I think it's important to note that the regurgitant jets have three components. So it goes up front again. Sorry for that. A flow convergence zone, also known as the PISA zone, a Vena contractor, and a regurgitant jet. And the Vena contractor is the relatively quick and easy way to assess a MAR severity. The Vena contractor is the area and the smallest part where the jet leaves the regurgitated orifice and it reflects the regurgitated orifice. And it's really, really, uh, relatively independent of hemodynamic and technical settings. So it's important that, at, that it's the same, uh, it's not the same as the anatomical orifice, which is a little bit more proximal because the flow after passing the anatomical orifice converges a little bit more before divergating again. But also this method has several limitations. And one, the, uh, uh, one is that the analysis is done at a single time frame, but frequently it's a dynamic phenomenon during the entire cardiac cycle. So using one frame, frequently you will use the biggest frame or the severest frame, you will overestimate the severity. And another important limitation of the Vena contract is the assumption that the circular, uh, the orifice is circular, which is not the case or is the case in frequently in organic MR, but not the case in secondary MR, where it's more a, 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 a line or non-circular orifice. So if you go to the quantitative grading of MR, let's see if we move on. So as set multiple parameters we can use, so we can calculate the IRWA, we can calculate the regurgitant volume or fraction, and both can be measured, the IRWA and the regurgitant volume, uh, uh, um, um, volume by the PISA methods, and the, for the regurgitant fraction, you also need the stroke volumes and the the cutoffs are shown here in this table. So the PISA method is the uh, 
proximal isophalasic method. So it's recommended in the guideline. Frequently, this is assessed in the four-chamber view. And for the PISA method, it's based on the fact that the valvular regurgitation, does it move on? I have a little bit delay every time. The, if you have a valvular regurgitation, the blood converges towards the regurgitated or first forming a concentric, roughly hemospheric shell in with increasing velocity and decreasing surface area. And the bigger the PISA uh, area is, the bigger the, or the, the bigger the uh, MR is. So how does it work? If it wants to move, if so in the four chamber view, here we can go, I'm a little bit afraid to press again. We, we, we zoom in on the color box, a small color box to have higher frame rates and we try to visualize the biggest rigurg in the jet, and then we put down the Nyquist limits to 20 to 40, as said before, and we measure the PCI radius. And the next step is to put on a continuous wave single over the mitral valve measuring the rigurg in the jet. And by measuring the, uh, the, the maximum speed, we can calculate the IROA, which is frequently already integrated in your software. And by tracing this, this, uh, this uh, signal, we can calculate the rigurg volume. As this method has also similar, several limitations, so the, the MR can, the PISA radius can be dynamic. And also here we can see it's the assumption of the circular orifice again, which is frequently not the case, but it also assumes that the PISA which you measure is at the same time as the peak velocity uh, looking at the continuous wave. And the biggest problem is that errors in the PCR measurement radius are squared, so easily to make faults, and it's trip, so it's in, 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 in it's squared in the formula, so you have big mistakes afterwards. So, uh, and it's not valid for multiple jets. For me, it's not advancing. Let's see. Here we go. And. We can also do a, a volumetric calculation of the MR. So the principle of the continuity equation, which is used for this, it states that the blood volume passing the mitral valve must be equal to the volume passing the aortic valve, like with the uh, aortic valve area with the aortic stenosis. So we can use this in multiple jacks, early, late systolic, uh, uh, systolic MRs, and it has been validated against CMR. But the limitations include that the errors in the, fail in the failure to measure the endless properly because it's a, 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 an oval shape instead of a circular shape to, to fail you to trace the signal properly and a sample to place our a sample correctly. And I think this partly can be overcome by using 3D to measure the oval uh, uh, mitral valve endless or by calculating the 3D LV stroke volume. So Finally, furthermore, we can use our 3D data set to do 3D multiplanar reconstructions to do the vein contractor area, also shown by Pat Patricia already, where we have a direct site on the vein contractor area, and this is simply can be traced. Uh, uh, and the nice thing is an individual uh, vein contractors for this can be summed up, and so you can use the multiple jets after, for example, a trench catheter edge-to-edge repair. It has a very good correlation with CMR, but also this, which you can see on the right, is greatly influenced by the gain setting of the machine, as shown here. And finally, we need to look at the hemodynamic consequences of the MR, especially if the MR is a little bit more than mild. So we have to provide LV diameters, volumes, left ventricular ejection fraction, left atrial dimension, and preferred is the volume, and of course the, the systolic pressure. And especially in the patient when there is a normal function or a low normal function, because you 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 think that there normal the there will be a hyperdynamic ventricle, this is important to use strain strain rate or other other methods to to early detect this function of the ventricle. Let's see if he wants to move. So, to conclude, if he wants, in patients with MR. We sh should start looking for, uh, with the first question, etiology or mechanism before we go to the quantification of, of the MR, and we should also take, check for the consequences of the MR. And we have to keep in mind that the MR quantification is challenging, challenging and, and, but, need, uh, and, but needed because intra and inter-observability is very high, and the assessment of the severity should be comprehensive and systematic, and each method has their limitation, and therefore we need to integrate the approach.
And uh, we also have to keep uh, in mind the loading conditions of these patients. And I think, as stressed already by Becky and also by, by Patricio, if you're in doubt and if the MR is more than, than moderate, you might want to send it to a comprehensive valve center to evaluate and to have a multidisciplinary team looking at these patients. Thank you very much. Thanks, Martin. Great presentation. I think we have a few minutes to discuss this further. And we have many, many questions. It's quite interactive. Let me merge a couple uh, of questions, Martin. Well, here, let me add two together. Uh, the concept of proportionate or disproportionate MR is useful in the real world or is, or is artificial? And let, let me link that with knowing that uh, Mitra FR like patients do not really improve at, after edge to edge therapy. What is your strategy in a severely dilated left ventricle and secondary severe MR? Do you use cutoffs of LB diastolic volumes? A very good question, and uh, I think it, it all started with the two trials with the, the mitral clip at that time. We had a positive co op trial, significantly positive, and a negative. A French study showing, unfortunately, no benefit of transcatheter edge to edge repair. And then there was this concept of having proportionate and disproportionate in MR. And it seemed like the patient that having a smaller ventricle with more MR seemed to do better after a transcatheter repair of this valve. And the patient with have a severely dilated ventricle with less MR or more proportionate MR to the dilatation seemed to improve less or to do less afterwards of these uh, uh, transcatheter edge to edge repair. And I think, of course, it's a theoretical concept. I think uh, we have to look at the patient, but it helps. I think looking at the dimension of the ventricle and to, to relate this to the amount of MR we have, it helps us to look at is this a patient that the MR is the problem of the symptom or is it the ventricle which is causing the problems of this patient? And I think if it's the MR, then we definitely need to treat the MR. If it's the ventricle, we maybe want to optimize medication because in these patients, you frequently also can get much better outcomes if you improve the uh, uh, medications given to these patients and might want to uh, avoid doing a transcatheter edge to edge repair. But of course, the, the mortality benefit in these kind of of patients is maybe less, but also for these kind of patients, maybe for symptoms, it might be uh, uh, interesting to give these patients a clip, but I think mortality-wise, the bigger the ventricle is, the less uh, 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 yeah, benefit you're going to expect in these kind of patients. But the real cutoffs, I don't think there are really uh, optimal cutoffs now. Of course, everybody is using the cutoffs of the co-op study at the moment to, to, to use uh, for, uh, but I think the more investigation has to be done. And I think it's a theoretical concept, but it helps us to, to, uh, to discuss these patients in these multiple disciplinary teams. Yeah, and, and in terms of cutoffs, Martin, because we have here another question, why do you think that we have different cutoff values for severity across the Atlantic, different in Europe or in the US? Yeah, that, that's, that's indeed a good question because you would say uh, severity is severity and, uh, and uh, the, the severity in Europe shouldn't be different than the severity in, uh, in the United States. I think the European took into account also a little bit the prognosis of the of the patients and and, and therefore the cutoffs is a little bit lower in, in Europe than in, uh, in, in than in America. But like I said already, I think the severity is the severity and the prognosis is the prognosis. And I think Becky uh, once said that very nicely, but I think that's that's the issue. So we and that the uh, severity influences the prognosis, we already know, but I think the quantification of the MR shouldn't be different. So I think we should look for and get uh, uh, the similar cutoffs for Europe and, uh, and America. Uh, Martin, can we expect severe atrial MR without a large LV? Uh, yeah, like, like I said, I think for the, for the, the persistent or long persistent or permanent AF patients, you some, in these patients, the LV function and also the dementia are frequently quite normal, but you have these enormous left, vent, uh, left atria in these patients and that is causing the dilatation of the, uh, of the annulus. And, and like I said, it's not like the restricted motions, what you see in, in, in secondary MR with an ischemic or dilated cardiomyopathy, frequently 
the leaflets are more flat in these kind of patients, so you can see the difference. But definitely, the uh, the LV dimensions or function can be completely normal in these patients. And I have here a very interesting question. All, all of them are really interesting. But uh, inside the operating room, it is justified. It is justified to administer vasopressors in a patient under general anesthesia who underwent mitral valve annuloplasty in order to assess the severity of an eventual residual MR? Yeah. Uh, like I said, I think anesthesia greatly influences and also after uh, uh, um, being on cardiac pulmonary bypass, frequently the patients are hypovolemic. So I think it's important to give a lot of fluids again to these, these patients to, to uh, get them in a normal fluid state, but also to give some inotropics. And of course, also, giving um, uh, too much ephedrine or these kind of things, you can have a, a big shoot in your blood pressure, and then that's also the risk of getting an overestimation of your severity again. So, like I said, you should be more looking at what is the normal blood pressure maybe for this patient on the outpatient clinic and more or less try to aim to get this blood pressure for the assessment at that time. So, yeah, give some, but not do not too much. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> excellent. And can you share any thoughts about uh, vena contracta area? Dr. Gethoff asked this. Vena contracta uh, area. And, and what, what's the question about the vena contracta area? Yeah, what are your thoughts? Is really useful? Uh, should we implement it always? I think I think transthoracic is sometimes difficult. Uh, a little bit depends on on the uh, uh, the quality of the transthoracic echo uh, images, and not always with color. These are perfectly. Uh, but if you have good quality, I think you should use it because it's nice, an easy measurement, and 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 with TEE, it's it's also easy to get this this images, and, and I think it really helps also assessing the patient prior and post interventions, like like I said, with a clipboard, these kind of things. It's an easy measurement. If you have two vena contractors afterwards, you can add them up. So it, it's it's easy. And all, a lot of all these other measurements cannot be summed up in, in with multiple jets or these kind of things. So I think it's a nice and easy way of, of get, uh, assessing the severity. I think some 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 studies are needed to 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 really find out the, the optimal uh, cutoff for these these patients. But I think it's a better way of doing it is and there's more software now coming up also to do, to do this more automatically for us and to help us uh, uh, with this clear answer well, I, 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 I think it's time for us to to move on i this has been a fascinating discussion and i think we could discuss much more vegetation for another half hour but uh without further ado i'd really like to move on to the last lecture which i think you'll find very interesting uh it's from dr uh, piberol and phil will talk about the tips and tricks for imaging your patients with aortic stenosis dr piberol yes becky Thank you very much. So I do have some uh, disclosure before getting started. Um, and uh, actually, um, this is the, uh, the question uh, I have uh, for you. Uh, in a symptomatic patient with a valve area uh, of 0.8, mean gradient 24, LVF 60%, stroke volume index 29, ML per meter square, which is your interpretation and management? So you have uh, four possible answers moderate AS, and then you do a call follow-up and click call follow-up in one year. CVAS, that's uh, answer B, and you recommend EVR. Dobitamine stress echo is the third possibility to confirm AS severity. And, um, and the last one is to use calcium scoring uh, to confirm AS severity. And I think we're going to have the uh, answers at the end of the uh, presentation, right? So there are several uh, stages in the progression of AS. Uh, you have the patient who at risk of AS, then uh, patient with mind to moderate AS. And for this patient, there is no indication for intervention. And then you reach the point where the patient has a CVAS, uh, essentially based on echo, based on these parameters. 
And uh, well, at first, the patient will have no symptoms, and there is no um, class one indication for intervention unless the LVF is reduced. And then uh, you have uh, what the American guidelines call the stage D. That's in fact patients with severe AS, so uh, and, and most of them will have a high gradient small valve area. In this case, it's a, it's a no-brainer if the patient has the symptoms. Uh, it's a class one indication for valve replacement. But then you have um, up to 40% of patients who have actually a discordant grading at echo, and they have a, a low gradient with a severe valve area, and these patients are much more challenging. And so in this algorithm uh, describing the timing of intervention for ES in the American guidelines, um, you have patients with uh, symptoms or without symptoms, and well, for those with high gradient, small valve area, again, generally there is not much issue and not, not much risk to underestimate or overestimate the, the stenosis severity. Where it's getting more challenging, it's in the patients, well, first with, um, as I said, the uh, this quadrant grading, the low gradient AS patient, because here all parameters of echo do not agree. And so we did. We need to do uh, more. And it's important because if it's severe AS, patient is symptomatic, you have a a indication for intervention. If not, it's going to be a conservative management. And also, I would like to raise your attention on the patient with moderate ears that we consider, you know, everything is moderate, but here as well, there is a risk for uh, underestimation. So uh, there are clearly uh, two um, categories of patients where we may have underestimation um, is the patient with low gradient ears and those with a moderate ears. And it's advancing uh, not as fast as we would like, but uh, so um, the main parameter that we use to grade the severity of AS, you have, of course, the picotic jet velocity and mean gradient that we measure by continuous wave Doppler. Uh, and, um, and these are the, the, the parameters that are most frequently used to grade the severity of AS, but they do have some limitations. Uh, the first thing is that you, you have to be very careful of doing a, a, a comprehensive, take your time to do a multi-window interrogation with continuous wave Doppler, because if you only do the apical chambers, the five and three chamber, you may uh, underestimate the velocity and the gradient, and therefore the severity of AS in, 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 in up to 50% uh, of the patient, because in 50% of the patient, you're going to get the highest velocity not at the apical views, but at the right thermal border. So very important to do the right thermal border and also the suppressed thermal notch. And um, now having said that, this is uh, the next uh, patient is, a, is an example of a patient with uh, um, uh, moderate AS on the basis of uh, uh, the apical uh, views, if you see here with a velocity of 2.9, the valve area was also larger than one. But then if you look at the uh, right sternal border, uh, then the, the stenosis becomes severe. Uh, the velocity is four and the valve area is now less than one. So this is very important, especially if this patient is symptomatic because it's going to change uh, the therapeutic management. So very important to have this multi-window uh, interrogation. Um, now, having said that, the right sternal border also has some limitation and, and particularly uh, the, the, the issue is uh, with the tracing. It's a, more challenging than in the other windows, uh, and you have to be careful not to be uh, too generous and, and overlap with the diastole. So it's important to look for the closing click and really stop your tracing at the closing clicks. Otherwise, you're going to overestimate the velocity time integral, and therefore uh, you may uh, underestimate the valve area. And on the other end, you may uh, also underestimate the gradient because the tracing of the gradient will be over a long period of time. So make sure to do uh, the tracing to, to, to start it and stop at the right place. The other issue that you may have, you know, there are not many, um, I should say, uh, cave hat pitfalls where you may overestimate the gradient. Generally, the tendency is more to underestimate the velocity and the gradient and therefore the stenosis severity. But if you mistake, uh, a MR signal for an nautic valve flow velocity signal, then you may indeed overestimate. This is an example here. The mean gradient is 31 uh, on this signal that we were thinking maybe was uh, uh, nautic valve flow, uh, but in fact, 
uh, this is this is MR. Uh, this is MR, and if you look at the uh, right signal, this is on the right here, the uh, Arctic downflow signal. You see that the main gradient is much lower, so it, it's really important to be careful. And 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 one, uh, I should say, tip to 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 make the, the, the distinction between the two type of signal. Uh, MR or TR versus Arctic valve flow is really the duration of the signal. Generally, an MR signal will be much longer, so you can measure uh, the duration of the signal. And and um, well, one of the other limitation of the mean gradient and, and velocity, obviously, is that they are flow dependent. They are highly flow dependent. We have to keep in mind the main gradient is a squared function of flow. This is why we also want to measure other parameters that are less flow dependent. They are not completely flow independent, but they are less flow dependent. This is in particular the valve area, the other the Arctic valve area. And here I want to uh, spend a little bit of time to to um, to state that there are actually two different types of uh, Arctic valve area that we often think are equivalent, but they are not. You have the anatomic orifice area. This is the one that we measure by planimetry on this emphasis view uh, by 2D or eventually by 3D echo. And, 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 and the Arctic valve uh, area is also measured, as you know, by the or calculated by the continuity equation to obtain the effective orifice area. The effective orifice area is really the cross-sectional area of the of the jet at the level of the vena contracta. And therefore, it's a different entity, it's a different parameter, and it's often smaller than the anatomic orifice area because between the anatomic and the effective orifice area, you have a contraction of the flow. And so uh, it's important to, to, uh, uh, to keep in mind that uh, if you have, a, a uh, let's say, uh, an anatomic orifice area of 1.2, um, and an effective orifice area of 0.8, the stenosis is hemodynamically severe. Uh, and, and we should not uh, con conclude that the stenosis is, is non-severe, is moderate based on the anatomic orifice area. You always have to look at the effective orifice area as well. Um, the, um, uh, uh, of course, another issue is, if the slide advances, yeah, is the, uh, and I should say this is the key issue uh, in the uh, calculation of the output of effective orifice area by the continuity equation is the uh, measurement of the LVOT area. And to do that, we measure the LVOT diameter. And uh, if you look in the uh, guidelines, the ASC guidelines and, uh, and the ESCVI and, and other publication, uh, you, will, you will see different information regarding how, how and especially where to measure the LVOT diameter. Uh, uh, some guidelines recommend to measure the LVOT diameter below the outer cannulas, 5 to 10 millimeter, based on the rationale uh, that this is where we also do the sampling of the velocity by pulse wave Doppler. And other publication, and more and more actually, uh, recommend to measure the LVOT diameter at the level of the analyst, at the base of the Arctic valve cusp, or very close to. And uh, actually, um, uh, uh, we we the 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 rationale for eventually measuring um, um, lower than the LVOT would be to say well the shape of the LVOT is cylindrical and therefore it doesn't matter where you measure the uh, LVOT diameter but in fact this is a study that we recently uh, published in in in, in Jace, uh, and um, and actually uh, showing that the um, um, you have a cylindrical shape of the LVOT only in 22% of the patient. Uh, about 75%, uh, the uh, shape will be hourglass. And if it's hourglass, then it means that the LVOT diameter measured below is smaller and sometimes much smaller than the LVOT measured at the analyst. And we compare with uh, CMR uh, for the assessment of low flow state. And actually, if you measure below the analyst, 5 to 10, uh, you overestimate uh, substantially the prevalence of low flow state. Whereas if you measure at the analyst or very close to the analyst, well, you obtain similar estimation of stroke volume and assessment of low flow state as compared to CMR. So a uh, very important take home message, measure your LVOT diameter at the analyst or very close to the analyst, not below. So this is the uh, double green arrows that you should go. The other thing is really too import important to, to get the best view. The first thing is to 
to have a zoom view in this parcel uh, long axis window and, and to try to get the imaging plane that bisects the right coronary cusp anteriorly, and that is at the commissure posteriorly. So actually you want to see well the right coronary cusp, but posteriorly you should not see well the cusp. If, if, if you see well the cusp posteriorly, it's because maybe you are truncated and you will underestimate the LBOT diameter. The other thing that I, I like to use as kind of safeguards is this uh, formula that is the the LVOT that is predicted according to the body surface area of the patient, and it works unless the patient is, is obese. Um, but if you obtain a value of predicted LVOT diameter based on BSA that is uh, more than two millimeter larger or two millimeters smaller, then maybe you should revisit your measurements. The other thing that is very important to systematically do is calculate the Doppler velocity index, the ratio of the velocity time integrals, because it's a, it's a good safeguard. For example, if I measure a Bavaria of 0.8 and the Doppler velocity index is 0 0.3, 0 0.35, which is moderate, not severe, then to me, this is a red flag that I may have underestimated the LVOT diameter. So, uh, the other issue with the LVOT diameter is when they have this type of patient with a calcification bar extending into the LVOT. It is tempting to measure the uh, diameter, you know, from the uh, inner border of the white echo to the inner border of the white echo. But if you do so, you're going to underestimate the LVOT diameter and therefore the valve area. So you need to exclude this uh, calcification and, 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 and put your cursor really up to the uh, or down to uh, the anterior mitral leaflet to uh, get, make sure to have a right estimation of the LBOT diameter. So alternatively, because we have this potential of underestimation of the LBOT diameter and therefore the LBOT area by 2D echo, uh, some uh, investigators have proposed to uh, measure the LBOT area by 3D echo or even CT angio and calculate an hybrid valve area, where the LVOT area is obtained by one imaging modality and the velocities by Doppler, so by echo. And indeed, this is useful to eventually co confirm the stenosis severity and reclassify the patient, often from severe to moderate. Uh, but if you use these hybrid uh, methods, you have to be aware that you cannot use the same cut point for uh, severity. So uh, with echo, typically you're going to use one centimeter square. But if you use these hybrid methods, it is important to keep in mind that they systematically measure larger valve areas. And so you need to use a larger cut point of severity as well uh, to, uh, to identify CVAS. So it's 1.2, not 1. And also to confirm uh, the uh, prognosis. So, uh, of course, LVOT diameter is one entity. Um, the uh, LVOT velocity that measure by pulse wave Doppler is also uh, subject to uh, pitfalls. Um, and uh, one of the um, most important pitfalls is uh, the uh, issue of um, uh, if, you, if your sample volume is uh, too far from the, the valve or the Doppler beam is not well aligned, this will underestimate the velocity. On the other end, if the, the Doppler sample is too close uh, from the valve, if you see some opening or closing click, you're too close and you're gonna overestimate the velocity. Also, if there is a flow acceleration in the LVOT because of the septal bulge, for example, with this typical dagger-shaped uh, velocity envelopes uh, on the pulse wave Doppler, then, um, you know that your stroke volume and therefore the valve area by continuity will be overestimated. And sometimes you cannot calculate if it, you have too much acceleration. The other thing is to trace these envelopes the right way. You don't want to do the tracing at the top of the envelope as we would do for continuous wave Doppler, because here we're looking for not for the maximum velocity, but more for the modal velocity, the mean velocity. So you need to trace a little bit inside and also avoid the top uh, spectral dispersion of the envelope. Um, so uh, these are the uh, all the pitfalls and, and tips and tricks with regard to the uh, measurement of the valve area. Um, and and so I will. I will the, the the last part of my presentation will be uh, on this challenging patient with low gradient AS, discordant gradient, where you have a small valve area that is severe, but with a low gradient that is moderate. 
And you have those patients with classical low flow, low gradient with LBF lower than 50%. Uh, but you also have patients with preserved DF who have nonetheless a low flow defined as strong volume index lower than 35 ml per meter square. That's the paradoxical low flow, low gradient. And then you have those who have normal EF, normal flow, but still they have this discordance between barrier and gradient. So how to handle these patients? Well, this is an example here. Uh, paradoxical low flow, low gradient patients with symptomatic LVF by biplane Simpson is 65%. Global longitudinal strain in this patient is typically reduced here, minus 13% by speckle tracker imaging. Grade two diastolic dysfunction. And if you look AS severity on echo, the valve varia is severe at 0.64. Very important to calculate the index valve varia, 0.36 also severe. Doppler velocity index, also severe, less than 0.25, it is 0.19. But the gradient is, is, is uh, the mean gradient is 26. So lower than they would expect for this level of valve area. But the patient is in low flow state, 29 ml per meter square. So um, in this patient, what the guidelines recommend is to, for those with the reduced LV ejection fraction, the classical low flow uh, on the left, it is recommended to do dopamine stress echo to uh, confirm the stenosis severity and differentiate true versus pseudo severe. For those with preserved EF, such as the paradoxical low flow low gradient, as well as the normal flow low gradient if they are symptomatic, uh, dopamine stress echo is not the ideal test and you should do a calcium scoring. It's a non contrast CT using the modified Ag Agatston method and you can quantitate the arctic valve calcium score. And it is now recommended. It's a, it's a class 2A recommendation in both the um, uh, European and as well the American guidelines to do a calcium score to confirm stenosis severity in patients with low gradient TS. And if in patients with paradoxical low flow, low gradient, you have a, um, a patient with symptomatic confirmation of severe TS by calcium scoring, it's now a class one indication for valve replacement in the American guidelines. And it was 2A in the 2017 guidelines. And we'll see uh, if this uh, uh, level of recommendation changes in the new edition that should come out soon. So one thing that is important to uh, uh, keep in mind is the cut point that you should use to differentiate true versus pseudo CVAS in those low gradient AS patients are different in men versus women. So you, uh, the, the cut point is 2,000 for men versus 1,200 for women to confirm the stenosis severity. And you see, this is the patient I showed you, calcium score of 3,200, so very high confirming uh, stenosis, uh, that the stenosis is severe and the patient underwent tablet. This is a checklist here of the uh, different uh, thing that we uh, covered uh, to uh, confirm the stenosis, uh, well, confirm the, the, the accuracy of our measurements and therefore the assessment of the uh, stenosis severity. I, I won't go through that um, uh, and, and just re-emphasize that for those with low gradient TS, you should not hesitate to use additional tests to confirm stenosis severity. Again, dopamine stress echo for those with low EF and calcium scoring for those with preserved EF. So in summary, the take-home message, to avoid overestimation of area severity by aortic valve area, very important to measure LVOT diameter at or close to the annulus. Systematically calculate Doppler velocity index as a safeguard and confirm it is less than 0.25 for severe, and eventually corroborate measures of stroke volume and valve area by other methods. To avoid, avoid underestimation of area severity by gradient and velocity, which is more frequent, I should say, very important to do a careful multi-window interrogation by continuous wave Doppler. Take your time. It takes time to find the highest velocity. And in those patients with low gradient AS, whatever is the category, classical, paradoxical, or normal flow, don't hesitate to confirm severity by the vitamin stress echo on aortic valve calcium scoring by CT because there is nothing worse to underestimate the AS severity in a symptomatic patient. Thank you very much for your attention. So uh, I think uh, we'll move to the... Um, uh, to the result of the poll before closing. Um, so, okay. So we'll see uh, what. Okay. So I uh, yeah I see now the results. So interesting. Um, 
I think it was uh, well distributed. Uh, few uh, selected the two first answer, which is moderate and severe. Yes, and I agree. I think we we need uh, additional tests. Uh, Dobutamine stress echo is an option, but definitely the, the optimal for this patient with preserved DF would be to do a calcium score. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Philip, for this great presentation. We have many questions, but let me ask you two quite hot here. What about normal flow, low gradient arctic stenosis? Is that true entity? Any tips to distinguish from a true moderate? Yeah, so um, interestingly, in the European guidelines, it is mentioned that uh, when you have normal flow, low gradient AS, it is, uh, severe AS is unlikely. Um, I think I would I would rephrase this and say it is less likely to be severe than in the other form of low gradient AS, but still, it, 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 there are several studies showing that if you have a bona fide normal flow gradient, it may be severe. And so, in a patient with normal flow gradient, once I've you know really uh, paid attention to to rule out measurement error and double check for the um, the accuracy of the measurements, and the patient is symptomatic, I really don't hesitate to, to use the same approach as paradoxical low flow low gradient and do a calcium scoring. Um, that's probably the best uh, option for this patient. You know, I'm a big uh, fan of echo, but uh, also there are some points where multimodality imaging is important. But again, I think we should go through the algorithm, you know, and when I have a normal solar gradient, I systematically look at Doppler velocity index, I revisit the measurement of LVMT diameter, make sure, you know, the, the multi-window interrogation for continuous wave Doppler was well done, you know, do all these things first, make sure that it's a true normal fluoro gradient pattern and not, as you mentioned, a moderate AS that was kind of misclassified maybe. Um, and, 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 and once I, I'm pretty sure of, you know, the conclusion in terms of, uh, the type of uh, flow gradient pattern and, and CVAS that I have, um, then I do eventually a calcium scoring as a tiebreaker, if you will. Yeah, clear answer, Philippe. A final question for you. Uh, if we estimate the aortic valve area uh, with the LVOT diameter measured in transophageal echo, should we also take larger cutoff value for severe aortic stenosis? What is your opinion? Well, I think, you know, uh, yes, I think if we um, if we use like this, let's say, hybrid methods where we measure the LVOT area uh, from different modalities like 3D echo by TEE or by TTE or CT angio, um, we generally measure systematically larger valve area because this cutoff value of one centimeter square was uh, historically, historically based on large series where the valve area was measured by 2D echo. And so, uh, and this cut point was established, you know, looking at where we, we have an impact on, on, on outcomes. So now if we use a, me a method that measure larger valve areas, then we need to also use a, a different cut point. And the cut point that has been validated, as I said, is more 1.2. So if you, yes, I would say if you use, if you measure the LVOT area uh, by 3D, uh, TEE, um, then you would maybe use a larger cut point. If you use, however, uh, I think if you use uh, 2D TEE, then it's okay to use the cut point of one centimeter square. Okay, thanks, Philippe. Uh, we have many, many questions, but don't worry, dear colleagues and friends, we will try to answer and accommodate all the answers in the web. So we are just about out of time, but before we go, let's have a brief recap of what we have seen today. Well, it was uh, quite uh, easy with these top teachers to summarize. And I think that if I may uh, add three blocks in the tricuspid, no doubt that tricuspid valve has a complex anatomy that is highly variable. Don't forget about that. Tricuspid regurgitation is highly prevalent condition with poor prognosis. So never underestimate those patients. Whenever you see at least a moderate TR, then refer to a comprehensive pulse center for further assessment and management. 
Well, we have seen uh, Martin's uh, talk and uh, in the mitral regurgitation, mitral, quanti mitral regurgitation quantitation is challenging, no doubt, but needed since we have intra and inter observer variability that is high. Assessment of the severity should be comprehensive and systematic. Integration, consideration of loading conditions is key. And finally, we have seen this terrific uh, speak from uh, Philippe, aortic stenosis. To avoid overestimation of aortic stenosis severity by abort, uh, aortic valve area, measure LBOT diameter. Calculate DBI and corroborate measures of stroke volume and aortic valve area by other methods. Integration. To avoid underestimation, this other problem, underestimation of aortic stenosis severity, we need to use multi-window continuous wave Doppler integration and in low gradient aortic stenosis, confirm the stenosis severity by DSE or calcium scoring by CT. Becky? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Pepe. Again, this has been a phenomenal webinar. Clearly, the diagnosis of severity of the disease is the first step in allowing clinicians to appropriately manage patients. And unfortunately, we know that these valve diseases have been underdiagnosed and therefore under-treated. And, there, and this program was designed to help clarify the imaging parameters used to assess both uh, tricuspid regurgitation and mitral regurgitation, and even aortic stenosis, where we still have pitfalls to the diagnosis, and therefore also identify key parameters which can help the, guide the clinicians and be able to correctly diagnose the disease severity and therefore appropriately manage their patients. Pepe? Yeah, dear colleagues and friends, that's all we've got time for today. I'd like to thank our faculty excellent teachers, monsters, Rebecca, Martin, Patricio, and Philippe for their excellent contributions. But our thanks to you for joining us, for not being shy. We have many, many questions. Hope you learned a lot. A reminder that this broadcast was brought to you by Radford Cardiology and sponsored by Edwards Life Science. You can review the program again on demand at radfieldcardiology.com. Goodbye and enjoy. <laughs>